Women have been giving birth for centuries, so it's a pretty natural experience, right? Wrong. I'm Stephanie King, professional doula, childbirth educator, and the creator of the My Essential Birth Course, the online childbirth education course that's helping women everywhere confidently achieve their best birth. Today's culture would have us think that birth should be treated like an illness or an emergency, and that most of us need other people telling us what's best for our bodies because we aren't the experts. So sit tight, because if you're tuning into this podcast, you'll probably start to believe in your body, your intuition, and find yourself empowered and confident to do what it takes to have the birth of your dreams. If you like listening to me take you through these weekly topics step-by-step, then you're going to love the My Essential Birth course. Make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast and definitely head over to myessentialbirth.com for the free downloads mentioned right here in these episodes and to join the birth course and community full of pregnant moms just like you. I have to add a disclaimer that I am not a medical professional and I cannot provide medical advice. All of the information expressed in this podcast are based off of personal, professional, and educational experiences and are my own opinions. Please work with a provider you trust for medical advice during your pregnancy and birth. This week's podcast reviewer of the week is Jenna K3491. Can I pretend that's Jenna Kutcher? Anybody who pays attention to her? Yes, we're just going to pretend. She says, my favorite podcast. This podcast has been such a blessing for me. I have been binge listening just about every day since 32 weeks, just hit 37 weeks this week, due at the end of March 2023. When I found out I was pregnant, I didn't think I had so many opinions about pregnancy and birth and was honestly just going to go with the flow. I am the type that has to know all about what is happening to me and all about some self-study research, so podcasts were perfect for me. I listen on the way to and from work, during work, while doing housework on the weekends, and basically when ever I have free time. I am planning on having an unmedicated birth in the hospital with an OB. I hired a doula and am currently doing all things to prepare. This podcast has helped me so much gain confidence despite the negative comments and birth stories from people around me. (laughs) Such a real thing. Uh, To have an unmedicated birth and feel good about my options and the decisions I'm about to make. I'm so happy I found this podcast and have learned too much just listening. The birth stories helped so much in these last few weeks in preparation mentally. Truly blessed. Thank you. Thank you so much for your review. Uh, Jenna, Miss Jenna Kutcher, which I know is not Jenna Kutcher. And you're probably more of exactly who I expect listening right here. Um, Being pregnant. This is so exciting. You are due in just a couple of weeks. I actually love this. A lot of times when I batch my episodes, they don't come out like the next week. But this one is actually going to come out before you are due. Um, And it's really exciting. I hope that the information here is actually going to be really useful to you because what I'm talking about today uh, is all about placentas. You guys, for those of you that are listening, this episode, I hope is going to be really, really helpful for you guys. Just kind of eye opening and the things that I haven't really talked about and maybe you don't hear about so much um, in regards to the placenta, but it is stuff that can happen kind of information for pregnancy, but also during the birth process. So I'm really excited about today's episode. And with that, we're going to move right into it. Um, Here's the thing. I've been getting a lot of messages asking me about placenta related things. Um, And your placenta is amazing. It's an organ. It is there to grow and nourish your baby. They come in different sizes. They attach in different places. But basically, it provides your baby with oxygen and nutrients during the um, pregnancy and birth process. But as your baby grows and it filters his or her blood. Um, And anyways, that's just to name a few. So there's there's several things that your placenta does. But Typically, you're not going to hear much about your placenta during pregnancy unless one of these kinds of, quote, complications that I'm about to talk about arises. So I'm going to give you kind of a heads up on some things that can occur. That way, if you do have these conversations during pregnancy or during the birth process or immediately postpartum, uh, then maybe you'll have an idea of what you can expect. The first one I want to talk about is an interior placenta. So after your egg is fertilized, it travels to the uterus and it implants in your uterine wall. And wherever it implants is where the placenta is going to form. So this little tiny, all these little cells get together and we're like, we're a baby. And then they stick (laughs) somewhere within that uterus. And that is where your placenta is going to form. Now, this can be anywhere inside of the uterus. Most often it is towards the back of your uterus or posterior. Um, However, sometimes it can implant anterior or the front of your uterus, meaning where you would like if you put your hand on your belly, it would be towards the front. Front, um, of your body. And 
when it does that, the front of the u- uterus is a normal place for it to form. Um, there's no necessarily like rhyme or reason why it happens. Although sometimes an anterior placenta can form where there is cesarean scar tissue. And so we see anterior placentas sometimes with moms who have had a prior cesarean um, and that that placenta implants where that scar tissue is which can be another issue that I'll talk about in just a bit. Um, but that's one one thing that can make it implant there. Um, you're more likely to have it implant there. But otherwise, we just don't know. It just kind of does what it wants to do, goes where it wants to go. Um, it doesn't cause any complications having it in the front necessarily. But you may realize that you have this if, um, well, first of all, if you have a scan, and it's diagnosed at the anatomy scan is typically when you would see it, that 20-week scan. Um, If you notice that your uh, provider or your midwife, um, whoever your healthcare provider is, when they're trying to hear the baby's heartbeat, whether or not they're using a machine or a stethoscope, that they can't really hear it or it's really soft or or they're having a hard time. Um, And then two, moms tend to take a little longer to feel baby's kicks, which makes sense because typically your baby uh, is laying like kind of you know, sideways in your belly. And when they're kicking, it ends up being a lot of on the front area, the front of our uterus, front of our bellies. And so when they're when they're doing that, the, it's really soft or subtle or you don't really feel it. And that's because of that placenta in the front where you're not feeling it on the outside of your belly. So if that is the case, um, just know that it's pretty normal. There's not necessarily anything wrong with it. The only uh, real complication or concern that kind of comes up is if it is in the front and you do end up needing a cesarean birth, obviously they're going to want to be really careful that they're not cutting into the placenta while they try to get the baby out because the baby needs that blood and oxygen. So it's really just information like nine times out of 10, 99% of the time, um, it's really not going to be an issue. So it's just information on where your placenta decides to hang out. Now, if you are noticing you're not feeling kicks and stuff, whether or not you have an anterior placenta, particularly with an anterior placenta, you can try laying on your side and you'll feel those kicks probably more on the side of your belly. But it's pretty common with babies that they like to kick forward. Those are all the little like pictures and videos that you see of, you know, bellies doing all these funky things and it's happening in the front. Um, I know even like when I would lay up against my husband's back, like when we were sleeping at night, he'd be on his side and I'd be on mine and I'd be behind him uh, with my belly on his back that my my baby would just love to kick at him. And it's just right at the front of the belly. So pretty, pretty common that that's where those kicks are going to be. And so if you're not noticing a lot of kicks, that can be why. Okay, let's talk about placenta previa. This is something that you may or may not have heard about it. Likely, if you have heard about it, it's because um, you're experiencing this yourself. So placenta previa, and this is where it can get a little tricky with ultrasounds and stuff. and, And I'll tell you why. Okay, so what is placenta previa? Now, typically your placenta is going to grow in the upper part of your uterus. And by upper, I don't mean like the very top of your uterus, although that is a very common place for it. But when we are talking about placenta previa, this occurs where your placenta is partially or fully completely covering your cervix. Um, so the if you think of your uterus in the shape of like a balloon and at the bottom of that balloon where you would tie it off, that we're going to call your cervix before it's tied off. Okay. So picture the balloon and it's got that little extra bit of the balloon at the bottom. That's the base of your cervix and, um, or the base of your uterus and what we call the cervix. It's part of your uterus. And so when we're talking about that little bit of extra there, that is the cervix. Um, and that's the area that actually needs to thin and open for your baby to come through. But that opening right there can't be covered or a baby can't come through it. And so with placenta previa, if you have a full previa, that means that opening is completely covered, which would necessitate a cesarean birth. If you have a partial previa, it means it's not fully covered. And whether or not it necessitates a cesarean birth will depend. Um, The thing is, it's fairly rare. However, when you are earlier in your pregnancy, it's... um, it's less rare, meaning you'll see it more often and it's typically caught on an ultrasound. Again, like an anatomy scan or something like that. Most often it's not a complete previa when they're catching it on the anatomy scan. Most often it's not going to be a big deal and it will move uh, if it's caught on the anatomy scan, especially if it's a partial previa. Um, But just know that that's something that can come up during your pregnancy. 
So it's rare, uh, but it's also common in the sense that about every one in 200 pregnancies will see this. So if this is you, just know it's on the list of things that can happen, um, but it's not immediate um, emergent cause for concern. Um, And then I'm going to give you some risk factors, although it is going to be person to person. So keep that in mind. But risk factors that are commonly listed or commonly discussed are uh, being over the age of 35. If you're carrying multiples, uh, if you've had IVF as how your baby implanted, um, if you're a smoker, if you've had a history of cesareans or you've had a cesarean before, um, and like I was talking about, it can attach to that scar tissue, which can be down a little bit lower. And as that placenta grows, gets bigger, all that stuff. Um, So those are kind of some of the risk factors. Now, it's, as I mentioned It's typically caught on like a first or second trimester ultrasound. We see it a lot with the second trimester anatomy scan when we're talking about women who do come up against this. Um, But if you have an ultrasound in your first trimester, your ultrasound tech should be checking for the location of your placenta right then. And that can give you an idea of of where it is at that time. So if you don't hear anything from your ultrasound tech when they've checked on baby and stuff, it's probably because it's just not an issue. Um, If the previa is suspected, though, it's likely that they will send you for, and if they don't, you should request, uh, unless they're just waiting and seeing. Like if it's a wait and see approach, that's great. If it's not a complete previa, that's great. If they catch it on the ultrasound and they're like, we need to put you with a high risk doctor or we need to schedule a cesarean birth. If that's the scary information and they haven't offered a transvaginal ultrasound, that's when I'm going to say absolutely request it. It's likely that in those cases they would offer it. But if they don't, now you have that information with you. A transvaginal ultrasound is something, it's an ultrasound that happens internally. So just like it sounds, it's a vaginal ultrasound. Um, It's a wand and it's not super uncomfortable. I've had these done and during pregnancy, um, it may be more or less comfortable depending woman to woman, how sensitive your cervix is, if you have endometriosis or any other things that are going to make it um, less comfortable in that area. But The reason for the transvaginal is an ultrasound going from the top. And even when they take that ultrasound wand on top of your stomach and they take it down low, um, even though they can see where the placenta is and that it is maybe partially covering, covering the cervix, they can't see how much it's covering the cervix. In other words, they don't know how big of a problem it's going to be. And so with a transvaginal ultrasound, they're able to go internally and see by millimeters um, how many millimeters it is or is not covering the cervix, which is going to give you a better idea of what your chances look like having to talk about things like cesarean or bed rest or, you know, having to be a little bit more careful with your activity and things. Um, So it's going to matter. Those measurements matter for when you're discussing those kinds of things with your provider. So it's good information to have. Um, I think when it is discovered, it's important to know just a couple of things. Number one, there's a difference between the partial and the full previa. Um, Like I said, partial means covering it slightly. Full previa means it's completely covering the cervix. Number two, the placenta can only move up as your uterus grows. So it's not something that crawls around. (laughs) It's not looking for a place to go. Um, As your uterus grows and think about a balloon as you blow it up, if you have something towards the base of the balloon where you're blowing it up and you keep blowing that it's naturally going to move up. That's exactly what happens with your uterus. So especially if it's a partial and it's just, a you know, a, a millimeter or two over like the chances and depending on where you are in your pregnancy, if they catch it at 36 weeks, obviously it's going to be a different situation than catching it first or second trimester where it's got tons of time for that uterus to grow and stretch and move that placenta. Um, but chances are it's going to move out of the way. And so take a deep breath. If you're if this you come upon this and you've heard this podcast take a deep breath. It's probably going to be just fine. Um, And if not, there's some things that you can discuss with your provider for how to handle it. And then um, number three was kind of, I kind of went over it just now, but most uh, partial previews are going to correct on their own. So you can kind of be excited or happy about that and not have to stress about it. Um, And the truth is you may not have known, like if the only ultrasound that you had was the one that was not transvaginal, then you have to worry maybe about, you know, is this going to move? Is it not going to move? Conversations with the providers, just getting the good information is always what I'm going to recommend that you do. Now, 
As far as symptoms or knowing if you have this or not, maybe you're somebody who chooses not to get ultrasounds. Maybe it's something that just didn't come up on an ultrasound or was missed. Um, Often there are no symptoms. So keep that in mind. However, in the second or third trimester, you may or may not experience some experience some bleeding. And so maybe you've heard me say before, definitely if you're in the birth course, you've heard me talk about kind of like emergency or when we call our provider or head to the emergency room or to the hospital. One of those is any trickling of blood. So we've talked about the mucus plug before um, and we, you know, that can have some like blood stained mucus is probably the only thing that you want to see down there. Any trickle of blood, though, is something that needs immediate attention. So this is a call to the provider while you're on your way to the doctor's office or the hospital, depending on where they want you to go. Um, And it can also cause some contractions. So that could be another symptom is having contractions earlier on before you're expected to. Um, That placenta previa can can cause that as well. Um, Now, if that happens, obviously, you're going to contact your provider. It's likely they're going to want to see you. It's likely they're going to want to do an ultrasound. And just so that you know, out of the women who are who are diagnosed with placenta previa, only about a third of the women with placenta previa will experience bleeding. So as I'm saying, you may or may not have symptoms and you may or may not have bleeding in the second and third trimester um, out of the one of 200, right, that are going to that this will happen to only a third will experience some of that bleeding. So it's more likely to catch it on an ultrasound. But bleeding is something that you can that you'll absolutely want to pay attention to. Now, like I said before, having placenta previa does not necessarily mean that you need to have a cesarean birth or C-section. Um, and in most mild cases, your placenta is going to migrate away from your cervix as your uterus grows. But your provider will be monitoring the position of that placenta and keeping track of it as you progress through your pregnancy so that you guys can decide together what the best action is going to be moving forward. So as long as your placenta moves away from the opening of the cervix, uh, you won't have any need for a cesarean birth. I think it's one of those times where the kind of like wait and see or wait and observe is probably the best thing that you can do. And I think most providers are going to go that direction. Um, If your provider is someone who's just more on the cautious side of things, who is like, I'm out of my comfort zone, I'm I'm sending you to high risk or whatever, um, then then great. That's probably a better care option for you if that's the reaction anyway. So keep that in mind, too. I have a really strong belief that whoever we're meant to end up with, provided we're putting in the work to do our best to find that the right provider and things, um, is where we're going to end up. It's where we're supposed to be. So if you end up with a high risk doctor, you know, you know, I've had a high risk doctor on here before. I also have talked about how they um, are just a little more chill in general, and it might be a really great fit for you. Uh, especially when they're like, we see all the really big stuff. Uh, This is not that big of a deal. You're fine. Do what you want. It can actually be pretty comforting. So anyways, that's information on placenta previa. Here's another one for you, though. Placental abruption. Now, again, Hopefully you haven't heard this term, but if you have, it might be because it has happened to you or maybe you have somebody very close to you that this has happened to. So placental abruption means that your placenta has detached from the uterus prior to birth and it can detach a little bit or it can detach all the way. But obviously, either way, that's going to be something that needs pretty immediate attention. You'll have to head to the hospital, get the ultrasound, do the tests, you know, make sure stress test, baby, all that's good. Um, And you might be put on immediate bed rest or especially later in pregnancy, it might be, okay. it's time to get the baby out. Um, But like I said, it could be partial or complete and they're they're classified as either mild or severe. So with the partial and complete, it's like this needs time and attention and immediate um, action now or it doesn't and it can wait. So a mild abruption. So if this is what you're hearing, a mild abruption usually doesn't cause any significant issues. And I think that's good to know, because when you hear the word abruption and it, it just kind of sounds like a big deal. Um, but mild means that it's going to be we're, we're going to take this one step at a time and, you know, treat mom and baby like everything is OK. We're just going to be a lot more cautious. Um, and that's when your placenta, obviously, with a mild abruption, it would just release a tiny bit. But a severe abruption um, is much more dangerous, and it's when a large portion or all of your placenta separates from the uterus. So obviously, that's going to put baby at risk of um, growth problems, depending on how 
much it's let go and stuff, premature birth um, and stillbirth. So these are, you know, we're saying kind of the scary stuff, but I want you to understand just like anything else, there are different levels of scary. Um, and hopefully you've got a great provider that you trust that should it get onto the scary side of things, they're able to handle things really calmly, carefully, and appropriately. Um, But let's talk about who's more susceptible. So if you are, again, over the age of 35, then they say you're more likely to have, it does not mean that you're going to, but these are the list of like, this could occur if, maybe more likely. Um, If you experience some kind of trauma, like a car accident or something, you know, where there's like a big shock to the body, um, a big um, like physical movement to the body, a smoker or drug user. um, And if you have high blood pressure, those are kind of like these women are more susceptible. susceptible. This one occurs one in every 100 pregnancies. That's still a very small percentage, um, but it is out there. So it's important that you know what you're looking at. Now, let's talk about some symptoms, kind of the how do I know if I'm experiencing this? So in the event that you are experiencing an abruption, here are some things that may occur. So you may have some vaginal bleeding. So again, it would be that trickling of blood. There's bleeding down there. Um, Sudden back pain. You could have contractions that come along with that. Baby's heart rate can be abnormal, which obviously if you're having those things, you're headed to the hospital so that they can get everybody checked out. Um, The uterus takes on more of a globular shape and becomes firmer. So you will notice a change or you can potentially notice a change in the shape of your belly um, and how, how it's feeling. The uterus rises in the abdomen. So instead of being where we normally expect it to be, it comes up a little bit higher. If you have a gush of blood, so again, talking about the scary, it's just information. Just use it as information. Um, If an umbilical cord descends more than three inches out of the vagina, so you can imagine as it's letting loose, that cord's coming down and it can come through the vagina. Um, And if you have uterine tenderness with or without contractions. So obviously sometimes, you know, maybe we might feel a little bit tender um but it would be more of like a painful tender not like a like oh my round ligaments (laughs) you know um probably a little a little different of a tender and obviously if you're experiencing any of those symptoms that's going to be an immediate call to your provider um some of the more serious ones that's an immediate let's head to the hospital Let's talk about next steps, too. So if these things are occurring, you're talking to your provider, here's kind of what will happen. When you meet with your provider and you're maybe experiencing a placental abruption, they're first going to do an ultrasound and they're going to want to see what's going on inside. You and baby are going to be monitored to make sure that baby is not in distress. Um, For mild abruptions that are earlier than 34 weeks, bed rest is usually the treatment. And so that's either at home or in the hospital, depending on what you and your provider decide is the best for you and your baby. And for a mild abruption that's after 34 weeks, it may be decided that it's safer for mom and baby to be induced Um, because obviously there are risks for both mom and baby. But if your baby is at that like we're right on the edge of being full term, it might it's a healthier thing because as it as I had said before, as that placenta detaches, they're worried about is baby going to be growing enough? Is this going to throw mom into labor early anyway? So if we can, you know, maybe avoid some of those bigger things, depending on where things are at, uh, then that might be a conversation that you're having at, at after 34 weeks. For a severe abruption, you need to give birth immediately. That's not something that they can wait on. This is, you know, babies in immediate danger. Um, mom and baby need to have this surgery and and do our best afterwards to make sure that baby's doing okay and mom recovers well. Uh, so obviously the baby would need to come sooner rather than later. And then a severe abruption can also lead to a lot of blood loss for mom. And it's making me think of partners because um, if dad's around too, it, it this is something that can be, you know, hard and even traumatic for both mom and dad. Dad being in a position of like, oh my gosh, I don't understand what's happening and I just want my wife or, you know, my birth partner to be okay um, and my baby. So this is good information for dads too so that they know, take it one step at a time. Um, it's something that can occur and if it does, they know what to do um, being the providers and hopefully it'll be a nice easy process in the way of this is scary but we're going to manage it 
And then um, as far as the birth process, it would be an emergency cesarean birth. So if that abruption's happening, you're having the blood loss, they, you know, looking at you and the baby and monitoring and it's like, okay, baby needs to come out now. So that's a little bit about placenta abruption. Before we finish up, though, I have two more. I want to talk about placenta accreta and I want to talk about retained placenta. So placenta accreta is when your placenta grows too deeply into your uterine wall. Now, when after you have your baby, what happens is you have contractions postpartum. So you've had your baby. And in fact, we say put them skin to skin, let them nuzzle near your breast. Um, that kind of like nipple stimulation or your baby being near your breast creates oxytocin. Oxytocin is the natural love hormone. It's also the hormone that creates contractions. Those contractions help to contract the uterus and birth of the placenta in a gentle way that allows the placenta to kind of fall off while little blood clots are being formed behind that placenta so that we don't have hemorrhaging. And so the placenta can... It it's, it's served its purpose. It's done. It needs to come out um, and be born. But sometimes that placenta can grow too deep into the uterine wall. And so it doesn't detach or it doesn't detach all the way. And it can be very serious. Um, it's something that you definitely want to be caught before you leave the hospital. It should be caught, if possible, immediately postpartum. Um, and, and you'll notice maybe if you've been at a birth before, but even if you haven't, you'll notice after you give birth and after your placenta is born, your provider is going to like put it in this big silver bowl or they'll put it in something so that they can look at it and inspect it. And one of the things that they're doing is making sure that all the pieces of it are there. And that's because placenta accreta is when, um, the placenta is grown into that uterine wall and all the pieces may not come out with the rest of the placenta. So that gives them a good idea of, oh, there might be um, there might be more placenta in there still and we need to do some things to get it out, which is we'll talk about retained placenta in just a minute, which is very similar to what I'm talking about. Um, but this is specific to how it grows into your uterus. OK, one step at a time here. Um, so basically, once your baby is born, and it's time to deliver the placenta. If it can't separate as easily as it normally does, it can cause severe bleeding for mom. Um, so obviously, we're going to try and avoid that. Now, there's two variations of placenta accreta. There's something called placenta increta. This is where your placenta attaches more firmly to the uterus and it becomes embedded in the organ's muscle wall. And then there's placenta precreta, where the placenta attaches itself and grows through the uterus and potentially into nearby organs like your bladder. So we've got a muscle wall and we've got now we're going to grow all the way through. And obviously, precreta is going to be a bigger, um, a more intense situation. But placenta accreta, if you're curious, because I've been giving you kind of <laughs> some idea of how often it occurs with these other ones. Um, that's about every one in 500 pregnancies. Um, and here's the you're more susceptible if part. So I talked about this kind of at the beginning. If you've had a prior cesarean, sometimes that placenta will attach to that scar tissue. That's always a concern. And if it does attach to the scar tissue, um, it's easier for it to embed and grow into. It seems like attach in such a way that it doesn't want to let go. It doesn't mean that that's going to happen. Um, it's still a low percentage on, on the chances of that happening, but it can. And so it's just something to be aware of. Uh, if you've previously had placenta previa for any reason, obviously you're going to be on the list of more susceptible because you've had it prior. Um, Again, if you are over the age of 35 or if you've conceived through IVF. So a lot of these placental things you'll notice share some of those same, uh, same who can be susceptible to these things. Now, placenta accreta usually has no symptoms. However, sometimes it can go along with placenta previa, but it's not like, a, oh, we're getting a trickle of blood and things like that. This is kind of like a postpartum issue that you're going to notice. So and sometimes it can be caught on ultrasound, um, like if it's attaching to other organs and things, and then sometimes you're not going to notice. So these are, I'll give you some symptoms though, that, um, that you may or may notice. So if you have a severe case of the increta or precreta, you can experience back pain when urinating, um, like if it were attached to your bladder. So that may, but back pain is such a tricky thing because when you're pregnant, I mean, name a time you don't have back pain, right? Especially as you're getting bigger. So it's kind of 
a tricky thing. Okay, so like I said earlier, when you have placenta accreta after your birth, the placenta will not separate from the uterine wall like it's meant to. Um, So there is a chance that mom can experience some severe hemorrhaging or bleeding postpartum when the provider tries to remove the stuck placenta. Uh, They often need to put their entire forearm inside of the vaginal canal to manually remove the placenta. And so especially for moms who don't have an epidural. So um, imagine the placenta is born, but they notice not all the pieces are there. So then they've got to manually go in and get it out. And to do that, sometimes, and I have been there, um, they really do have to stick their arm quite far in and scoop um, within the uterine wall, like literally grabbing with gloved hands, um, trying to make sure they get all the pieces. And obviously, if you do not have an epidural, that's going to be fairly uncomfortable. So I know for a lot of the moms that follow along here and you're unmedicated, it's not comfortable, obviously, um, but necessary and really important that they do what they can to get that out. Um, so and typically with a, a placenta accreta, that is even in itself not going to be enough and you'll likely need a dilation and curatage. So that would happen postpartum in the hospital, you know, probably under anesthesia. So um, you just, again, information. And so you can be prepared for that. If the placenta accreta is discovered before labor, then the provider will probably recommend that mom has a cesarean to try and manage the potential blood loss. You can choose whether or not you would like to go that route. So obviously you would be weighing some benefits and risks there um, and want to make sure that it's a very clear placenta accreta and not a best guess before jumping into surgery. Um, But obviously there are risks and benefits to each. So something for you to look into. Um, It could also be, it could be found by an ultrasound or an MRI. And so if an MRI is ordered, it's because clearly there are some concerns that were found on the ultrasound and that's an option for, for you as well. In extreme circumstances, mom may even need a hysterectomy to control blood loss. So that would be a pretty extreme circumstance. Um, however, that would and it would be on the rarer side of things, even with this placenta accreta being an issue. Um, so remember that that's it's really just information. But those are some of the things that you can expect. Um, and two, I think it's important when we're talking about this and um, a dilation and curatage. You know, I have had women. I've had I had a student actually who had dealt with this and. They did the DNC after, like they didn't realize that placenta accreta is what was happening. And by the time that they did, they had to go back in and do a DNC and they did it and they did a very aggressive DNC, which caused the uterus to form so much scar tissue that it like kind of melded together. Um, She was still able to have more children. She had to see a specialist um, and it was a pretty miraculous, pretty neat thing. Uh, just listening to everything that went down. But eat, my, my point is like, even with all of that, even in the most extreme cases, and in, in her case, she obviously didn't have a hysterectomy. She didn't lose her uterus. Um, she meeting with a specialist and having to completely clean out that scar tissue and everything, she was still able to have more children. Um, she did become high risk after that. I think her first baby was born all natural, no medication in a hospital setting. But because of, of the accreta and the how it was managed. Um, It kind of made things a little trickier going forward. But I hope that was like a hopeful story that even in the case of this kind of crazier version of this, uh, everything turned out to be okay. So being with good providers that you trust, again, you know, really important people that are skilled in these kinds of things. If you feel like that is a high risk thing, if your doctor is not like if they caught it, but they're not really comfortable with it, um, then moving to a provider that is would be the way to go. Now, Last one before we go, all about placentas today, you guys. It's very exciting. Retained placenta. And I know I'm like saying a lot of this with a smile so that I don't look boring on screen, but I want you to know I'm not necessarily happy about these. (laughs) Um, It's just information and I want you guys to have it. Um, I do like talking about birth stuff though, and I feel like I can smile talking about some of the tricky things here. But anyways, um, let's talk about retained placenta. 
So it's kind of obvious what it is, right? So it's normally after you have your baby and we go to give birth to the placenta. Um, we're waiting for it to expel and release and leave the body. Uh, it usually happens in about 30 minutes. And when it doesn't, that's when they start to get concerned about retained placenta. So there are three different variations or types of retained placentas. I'm going to tell you a little about each of them. The first one, and I am not positive I'm pronouncing this right, is placenta adherens. Um, it's the most common and occurs when the uterine contractions are not strong enough to expel the uterus and that results in the placenta hanging on use loosely to the uterine wall. And so after you give birth to your baby, you know how they come and do, or if you haven't had one yet, they come and do a fundal massage. So you give birth to your baby and then, um, Oftentimes it can be it's after your placenta is delivered, but it can be before as well, as well where they give some massage to your the, the top of your fundus um, or the top of your uterus. And they just this fundal massage and they're kind of like with their hand or a fist kind of massaging and pressing down towards your pubic bone. Um, the idea is that it's encouraging your uterus to clamp down or have that contraction that helps to expel the placenta. So sometimes our uteruses are tired after giving birth and they're not doing that hard work. Um, it's another reason that they in include Pitocin as part of that like postpartum. After you give birth to your baby, they give you a shot of Pitocin or a uh, you know, shot in the leg or the IV. Um, that can be all reasons why they're trying to do that. Um, but again, if they can't get that to let go, then they have to manually go in and help remove the uterus or the uh, placenta from the uterus. So keep that in mind. Again, this is something where a DNC is probably going to be needed in the postpartum time. Um, next is a trapped placenta. And this is interesting, but it detaches from the uterine wall, but it is not coming through. It's not expelled through the cervix. Um, and what usually happens in this case is that the cervix closes down before the placenta can make it through. It's rare, um, but if that is the case, then your provider will probably do some sustained cord traction. So they're going to continue to pull on that cord and help it move through the cervix as much as they can. If needed, they'll use something. Um, they'll do a relaxation of the uterus and cervix through a nitroglycerin. And then there's obviously the manual removal of the placenta under gen general anesthesia. So obviously this is on the rare side of things, but a trapped placenta that's what it can look like. Um, the last variation is placenta accreta, which we've already talked about. So all of them are fairly rare. Now, women uh, that are at risk of having a retained placenta, it's the same things as before. It's um, a woman over the age of 35. Um, if you have a premature birth, that, that it can happen a little more commonly, kind of like the placenta wasn't done doing its thing. It, it tends to, to stay in there a little bit easier, a little longer. Um, a long first and second stage of labor. Again, this is just information. It doesn't mean that's going to happen this way. It's just too susceptible. Um, and then if you have a stillborn baby, then it can be a little bit tricky with the placenta as well. Now, the obvious sign that you're dealing with a retained placenta is going to be that your placenta doesn't come out <laughs> um, or it's not born easily postpartum. Um, and then sometimes it's missed and if only a small piece breaks off and remains. And that can be a little tricky because this will be the mom that, you know, she gives birth, you know, she has the regular bleeding and stuff um, postpartum, but then she's a couple weeks out. She's still bleeding pretty heavily at five weeks, still bleeding at six weeks. There's kind of a foul smell. Maybe you've got a fever. Maybe you've got some bleeding and pain, not realizing um, it's not the normal postpartum bleeding and stuff. Like there's actually a piece of placenta in there and now we're having a problem. If that's the case or you're noticing any of those things happening, then it's time to hit the hospital, you know, call the provider, um, go to the hospital, and it's likely to you'll do a DNC under anesthesia and have it removed because it can lead to serious infection. So if you're dealing with a retained placenta situation, um, best breastfeeding can be really beneficial in helping to get that going. So that's always why we say after baby's born, immediate skin to skin, have them up by the breast if you can, have them nursing if you can, particularly if they're having an issue getting the placenta out, you know, really trying to get them nursing instead of even just waiting a little bit. Um, it can help your uterus to contract and, and all of that. But that's kind of where those, that's what's happening when you breastfeed is it's creating those contractions. And so if you've heard me talk about after pains before, these are pains that are caused. They're brought on by breastfeeding. They get 
more intense with each birth most of the time. Um, and that's what it's doing, though, is it's helping make sure that your contr- your uterus contracts back down to its normal shape and size. Um, now, since your provider might also try to manually remove the placenta, you're going to have to be aware that anytime something's inserted into your vagina, there's a risk of infection. So um, even if they do go in, they get everything out, it looks really nice. There is that risk of infection because you've had, you know, different things, um, different bacteria and stuff that can be presented into that. Uh, environment where they shouldn't be. And then there's also some drugs and medications that they can give you to relax and aid in the expulsion. And then the kind of the last resort that you'd be looking at would be surgery. So if something really isn't working, then it's like, okay, we've got to deal with this, you know, now. So this <laughs> it's a lot of information on placentas, you guys, and all the scary stuff. Don't listen. Um, but Let's let me close. I know it's a lot of heavy information. I want it to be just that, though. We talk about some things on here where it's like, oh, that's a little scary. It's just information. There are so many different things that can happen during birth. And if all we're focusing on is all the like craziness of it, then, yeah, we're going to our sites will be in the wrong direction. So make sure that you're like, oh, that's really good information. Um, I can't control it. And it's good information to have in the back of my mind in case I have to deal with this later. And now I know the terminology for when people are saying things like retain placenta, placenta, accreta, placenta previa, anterior, placenta, um, all those different things that can kind of happen during the birth process. Let me be honest, though, we don't get to pick and choose what happens to us during our pregnancies or even postpartum. However, we do get to control the knowledge, um, the recognizing signs, the being part of the decision making. So that's when you go back to the brain acronym. So you're asking, what are the benefits? What are the risks? Are there any alternatives? Trusting your intuition, realizing that you can say no to any of these things or that you need some more time. Um, That can be a really good place to come back to when you're dealing with any of this kind of stuff. So store this information away use the signs to keep an eye on yourself. It's good information for your birth partner to have um, or maybe be aware of in case these things come up. Um, But have an excellent pregnancy because honestly, even with this information, that's exactly what is likely to happen to you. So I hope you have an incredible birth and you get to use this information as just information and you don't have to talk about it again. That's it for this week, but make sure you subscribe to the podcast so that you get notifications first as I drop new episode every week. And don't forget to head over to myessentialbirth.com for all of the free downloads mentioned here and to join the birth course and community serving pregnant moms just like you. If you enjoyed this and other episodes, I would love it if you would take a few minutes to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. I read every single one and include one at the beginning of each episode. See you next week.